With the widespread use of mRNA vaccines against COVID-19, I mean Pfizer's and Moderna's COVID-19 vaccines, many people are concerned about the ingredients that are being used in this vaccine, that what are the components of these vaccines. Today we will talk about the ingredients of mRNA vaccine and I will not just name those ingredients but we will discuss in detail that what is their exact purpose, what is their function in the vaccine. Hello, I am Dr. Azal from MedicoVisual.com. Welcome to this visual lecture. As you already know, the active ingredient of these both of these vaccines is mRNA and this mRNA is of spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. And as described earlier, this mRNA, naked mRNA, cannot enter into the cell. Furthermore, it can be degraded by RNases present in the extracellular fluid. So, to mitigate this problem, lipid nanoparticles are used. So, here are the mRNA particles. These are the mRNA particles. These mRNA particles are encapsulated or embraced outside by this lipid nanoparticle. This lipid nanoparticle will protect this RNA from RNases as well as it will safely transport these RNA, mRNA into the cell. This lipid nanoparticles interacts with some components of cell membrane and is pinched inwards forming an endocytotic vesicle. This sac-like structure is called endocytotic vesicle and this process is called endocytosis. We have already discussed the details in another lecture. Within the endocytotic vesicle there are special chemical sensors these are called toll like receptor 7 and toll like receptor 8. They can detect the presence of foreign genome. I mean they can detect the presence of foreign RNA. Of course this is a foreign RNA in the endocytotic vesicle and it can trigger an innate immune response. It's, it's like a radar system of our immune system. After detecting this foreign RNA it will raise the alarm. <coughs> Then what will happen that as this RNA or mRNA will be released into the cell and it will start undergoing the process of translation into protein into the spike protein. Uh, you know these are the ribosomes and this is the transfer RNA bringing the amino acid. Now this process is hampered by that alarm system by that innate immune system innate immune system will hamper the translation of this foreign mRNA. This is a protective safety mechanism. Now this is a problem here. We want this mRNA of spike protein to be translated into spike protein but here the immune system is halting this process. Furthermore it can even destroy this mRNA. So that's not what we want. What we want is that we need the translated spike protein to be expressed onto the cell. So to mitigate this problem what we do is that this is the normal RNA. This is the normal structure of RNA. It consists of these subunits called uh, nucleotide bases. This is one nucleotide base, this is second, third and fourth and so on. right? And these nucleotide bases are cytosine, C for cytosine, guanine, adenine and uracil. Now what we do is that we replace, we substitute this uracil with a modified nucleotide base. For example, rather than uracil, we use N1-methyl pseudouridine. Although this is a modified base, but it is naturally occurring. It is a normal component of transfer RNA, not mRNA, tRNA, which is another type of RNA. It is normally present inside the cell. I am telling you this because many people in comments, they will start saying that, oh my God, they are using these modified bases. I don't know what type of toxins they are going to put in my body and all that thing. So let me clear the air here that it is not something dangerous. It is naturally occurring modified base that is being used here. Let me show you the proof. So here is a research article and in this article you can see that among the modified bases present in the transfer RNA there is N1-methyl pseudouridine as well. 
I will put the link in description to this article. So in summary, the active ingredient of both of these vaccines is modified mRNA and it is modified in such a way that rather than uracil, we are using N1-methyl pseudouridine. Now let's talk about excipients. Anything other than the active ingredient of any drug or vaccine is named as excipient. So this is the negatively charged mRNA and by the way why it is negatively charged? It is negatively charged due to presence of these phosphate groups. These phosphate ions are negatively charged. So here is the negatively charged mRNA and this mRNA is then bound with what are these? These are cationic lipids. The, this mRNA is anionic. Anionic means that it is negatively charged and these, these heads, these polar heads of these lipids, they are cationic. So these are cationic lipids. So we use cationic lipids and these cationic lipids, they orient themselves in such a way that their polar heads, these polar heads, they are stuck into this mRNA while their non-polar, these legs, they are oriented outward. A permanently cationic lipid, I mean that has a permanent positive charge, it is toxic for the cell, it can disrupt the cell membrane structure. So again to solve this problem, we are not using a permanently cationic lipid. Rather what we use is that we use a lipid that is only cationic or positively charged at acidic pH. At acidic pH, it will take up protons and acquire a positive charge. While at physiological pH of body, it will stay neutral, it will not have any charge. Such type of lipid is not simple cationic lipid, it is actually ionizable cationic lipid. The ionizable cationic lipid that is being used in Pfizer's vaccine is, is named as ALC0315 and this is the complete chemical name, I am not gonna read that. And ionizable cationic lipid present in the Moderna's vaccine is SM102. So these are these uh, RNA particles encapsulated by ionizable cationic lipids. It is then further surrounded by another layer of phospholipids and this layer consists mainly of non-cationic lipid plus some pegylated lipids and some plus some ionizable cationic lipids are also present. Then there are some cholesterol particles also present to impart the structural stability and integrity to this structure. Cholesterol also maintains the fluidity and rigidity of the structure of lipid nanoparticle. What is the function of pegylated lipid? Pegylated lipid is such lipid that is conjugated with this special structure called PEG, polyethylene glycol. So what is the function of pegylated lipids? One function inside the body is that this pegylated lipid decreases the clearance of this uh, lipid nanoparticle. It will slow down the take up of these lipid nanoparticles by immune cells thus decreasing the clearance of lipid nanoparticle. Another function of this pegylated lipids is that they provide the steric hindrance thus preventing the fusion of particles with each other. So these particles they will not fuse with each other, they will stay apart from each other. If these pegylated lipids were not added, they may clump together forming a large missile of lipid and it will not remain dissolved in the vaccine's solution. So that's why pegylated lipids are added. Ionizable cationic lipids that are being used we have already discussed. What about non-cationic lipids? Non-cationic lipid being used in Pfizer as well as Moderna's vaccine is called DSPC. While the pegylated lipid being used in Pfizer's vaccine is named as ALC0159 and that being used in Moderna's vaccine is called PEG2000-DSPC. 
DMG and of course cholesterol is present in both type of vaccines. There are some other excipients as well that are not components of lipid nanoparticle. Lipid nanoparticle is like the cell membrane of an animal cell. If an animal cell is put in a solution with very little salt concentration that is hypotonic solution, it will pull water inside, the cell will take up water inside, it will engorge and it will ultimately burst. But if the salt concentration is just right, the water that is entering inside the cell will be equal to the water that is coming out of the cell. That is, there will be no net gain or loss of water. Such cell will be very happily living and that will be a normal condition for the cell. Similarly, if the cell is put in a highly concentrated salt solution, what will happen that most of the water from the cell will come out and the cell will shrink. Both of these situations are not normal. We do not want this. We want to keep our cell happy and and same principle applies to lipid nanoparticle. It needs a very precisely controlled condition of tonicity and pH. It needs a proper salt concentration to remain effective. Furthermore, the pH should also be adequate. As we have discussed already, if pH is low, ionizable cationic lipid will become highly positive. So that's not what we want. We want to maintain the pH at a certain level. So for this purpose, a right concentration of different salts as well as pH buffers are used to maintain the tonicity as well as the pH range of this vaccine. The salts and pH buffers that are being used in Pfizer vaccines are sodium chloride and potassium chloride. These are the salts. Dibasic sodium phosphate dihydrate as well as monobasic potassium phosphate this is being used as a buffer and then of course all these things are dissolved in water. Salts and buffers in Moderna's vaccines are promethamine and romethamine hydrochloride and the buffers are acetic acid as well as sodium acetate and of course they are also dissolved in water. As you know, the components of these vaccines are highly fragile. They need to be stored at sub-zero temperature. At this temperature, large ice crystals may be formed. And such ice crystals may damage the structure of this lipid nanoparticle, which we do not want. And to prevent the formation of these ice crystals, we use cryoprotectant. Sucrose or table sugar that we routinely use in our homes is used as a cryoprotectant in both of these vaccines. Thank you so much for watching this video.